Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for Reconnecting with Rensselaer, an ex exclusive international virtual event. My name is Austin Powers, and I'm an Advancement Officer at Rensselaer and work with many of our international members. We had hoped to host some in-person Rensselaer events for our international alumni, alumni and parents, but much like everything else, the COVID-19 pandemic has prevented us from, do from doing so. We hope that you'll be able to join us once again when it's safe to do so, but until then, we are happy to have the opportunity to connect with you all virtually and are thrilled in your interest in learning about research advancements at Rensselaer that confront challenges facing humankind, including COVID-19. I encourage everyone to ask questions by using the Q&A function on the side of your screen. We will be addressing them during the Q&A portion of the program after the presentation. Without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Robert Hull, who is the Acting Vice President for Research at Rensselaer, the Henry Burlage Junior Professor of Engineering, and the Director for the Center of Materials, Devices, and Integrated Systems. Welcome, Dr. Hull. So thank you, Austin, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today, I and mean, we're really looking forward to the next hour. So what I will be doing is uh, giving you a brief overview of the research enterprise at Rensselaer. Uh, we'll delve a little bit deeper um, into the area of energy and the environment, and one of our very talented graduate students will be giving a brief presentation on her work and then I'll give you a brief update of what we're doing in the area of research uh, aimed at mitigating or addressing COVID-19. So could I have the first slide, please? I guess we want to go to full screen mode. So what you're looking at here, thank you, uh, is our beautiful um, building for biotechnology and the life sciences. Uh, it was built about 15 years ago uh, as part of the revitalization of our campus uh, led by our current president, uh, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. So next slide, please. So the research at Rensselaer spans the full spectrum from fundamental science uh, into areas such as the origins and fundamentals of uh, life, uh, understanding the fundamental science of water, energy, and sustainability, biomedical science, modeling, uh, the list goes on. And I want to emphasize this research spans all five schools at Rensselaer. Of course, in the schools of engineering and the school of science, but in the architecture uh, school of architecture, we have wonderful programs on the built environment uh, and on acoustics and on lighting. Uh, in uh, humanities, uh, arts, and the social sciences, uh, we have wonderful research programs in areas as diverse as cognitive sciences in gaming uh, theory. And then uh, in the Lally School, we have uh, research into financial technologies, for example. So this involves every department, every school across the university. And it involves about uh, 900 PhD students in total, as well as a large number of master students. And we engage deeply our undergraduate population in our research. So we go to the next slide, please. So that fundamental science underpins advances in devices, in systems, and in technologies, from advanced manufacturing to wide band gap power electrics, social network dynamics. Uh, and again, the list is uh, long and deep and broad impact. So next slide, please. This is how we organize our research in Rensselaer. Uh, according to the Rensselaer plan, we have two broad areas of impact. Infrastructural resilience, sustainability, and stewardship uh, is one. And the second is beyond the internet, digital meets reality. Within that, we're organized into five signature thrusts in biotechnology and the life sciences, at nanotechnology and advanced materials, energy environment and the smart systems, computational science and engineering, and media, arts, science, and technology. We have five institute-wide research platforms which support advances in those areas. And we're always focused on research that makes an impact and research that addresses global challenges. So next slide, please. So this gives some example of the work under one of our two main research headings, infrastructural resilience, sustainability, and stewardship. 
sustainable infrastructure in terms of both the environment uh, and the built, um, uh, built environment and built infrastructure. And one of those images there of that beautiful lake is of Lake George, which is one of the most heavily studied lakes in the world uh, under the leadership of uh, a Rensselaer IBM partnership. And you see other areas in terms of healthcare technologies, transformative materials, advanced manufacturing, and many others. Next slide, please. This shows our major, major focus on uh, uh, virtual and computational sciences. Uh, digital meets reality. We have a major institute, data exploration and applications, which is making impact in areas as broad as healthcare, uh, business systems, built and natural environments, uh, uh, policy, ethics, and stewardship, materials, informatics, uh, and again, the data analytics and artificial intelligence realm is infusing the full spectrum of our research at Rensselaer. Next slide, please. We have the world's most powerful supercomputer in a private university. This is called Amos. It runs at many petaflops per second. Um, and uh, by the latest count, it's the 29th most powerful supercomputer in the world. And most of the competition at that uh, level is from massive uh, national laboratories or from major corporations or from nation states. So this is an area where Rensselaer is truly preeminent. Next slide, please. And also the area of biological complexity. That building I showed you uh, uh, houses CBUS, our Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, where we study the most fundamental mechanisms of biomolecular science uh, and how that ultimately translates into treatment of disease and uh, biological solutions to human, biomedical solutions to human health. Next slide, please. And again, across the field of infrastructural resilience, sustainability, and stewardship. And now I want to move on to some of our work, just a brief taster in the field of the environment. Uh, energy and climate change. So we have uh, a major focus, including uh, one major research center, our Center for Future Energy Systems, in the whole field of energy stewardship, from developing new materials for fuel cells and for uh, battery storage, through to understanding the very complex challenges of the national power grid as renewables are integrated into it, uh, ever more in uh, ever more increasingly. Uh, we have research into carbon sequestration, being able to capture harmful emissions at the point of generation, again building on science uh, of the very most fundamental properties of materials. And we have broad activities in the field of the changing environment. We have researchers who are understanding emergency response in the Arctic, for example, um, as more and more people you know, or have access to a part of the world which is hitherto inaccessible. Uh, and we have researchers who are working with uh, indigenous materials uh, uh, in different parts of the world, including uh, using uh, uh, renewable materials such as coconut uh, residue in Ghana, which is shown on the bottom right. So again, Rensselaer researchers are helping to address the global challenges which face us in the 21st century. If I could go to the next slide, please. This shows some of our work in uh, energy stewardship in more detail uh, in Professor Karotkar's lab in uh, um, our mechanical aerospace and nuclear engineering department. He and his students are working on developing new materials for new battery systems with higher energy density than conventional materials. So that will be important, of course, for electric transport. It'll be important for energy storage. Um, Professor Chelson Bai in our chemistry department is doing uh, internationally recognized work in developing new membrane systems for fuel cells. And um, uh, yeah, that work could be you know, of enormous importance uh, as we look at the uh, renewable sources for, um, uh, for transportation. And Professor Lakshmi in our chemistry department is uh, understanding the fundamental mechanisms of photosynthesis and how we may apply that to biochemical solar conversion. 
Next slide, please. So this shows an example of uh, the work on carbon sequestration by Professor Mao in chemical engineering, uh, using uh, properties of uh, materials and using nanotechnology to be able to design materials which can act as molecular sieves for carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so the next slide, please. And equally, we're important, uh, we're, we're very focused on the built environment, the part of the environment which uh, so much of the world lives in, um, and understanding and addressing the challenges of increasing urbanization. Uh, the number of people who live in cities uh, will approximately double over the next 30 years, and understanding how to create solutions which work for those populations and interfaces effectively with the planetary ecosystem is a major challenge for humankind. And, um, you know, on the left, we're acknowledging that, you know, even with current populations, uh, we don't have the right solutions. So developing the new technologies, uh, the right solutions for a million people who uh, live uh, under marginal conditions in current cities. So, um, I should say a billion people, I should say, a billion people who live under marginal conditions in current cities. So we're working across the entire institute to launch a new focus on uh, developing the solutions for future built environments and their interface with the natural environments. So next slide, please. I alluded earlier to the Jefferson Project, which is a joint uh, effort between Rensselaer and IBM. What you're looking at there is Lake George, which is a, a lake in the Adirondacks, about an hour's drive uh, north of, uh, um, of uh, Rensselaer. And it is reputed to be one of the uh, cleanest freshwater lakes uh, in the country. Um, it has proved until very recently totally immune to harmful algae blooms, for example, though there has been one very recently. Um, and what we're doing in conjunction with IBM is we're making this the most heavily censored and one of the world's most studied lakes. So we have millions of sensor readings every day from across the lake. We integrate with, with weather data models from IBM to understand every aspect of the biology and the physical distributions of this ecosystem. So next slide, please. So, and actually, if you could click again, some more numbers will come up. Thank you. So uh, we have 52 sensor platforms distributed across the lake with over 500 sensors. And we have well over half a billion sensor measurements made to the edge. And these sensors uh, are autonomous and they're smart. So we call this intelligence at the edge, distributing computational power and uh, not just from a central source, not just from having passive sensors, but having active sensors which can make their own decisions. And uh, we view this as, a, uh, as an exemplar of uh, the concept of edge and hybrid computing, which we can extend to other environmental systems. So next slide, please. So this work has garnered local, national, and international recognition. It's led by Professor Rick Relia in our biology department. Um, and again, it's a major partnership with IBM. And uh, it really has highlighted the work at Rensselaer spanning again from the molecular level all the way through to uh, a system which in this stage covers many tens of square miles. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And as I said, we want to understand how to extend this to other global challenges. So, for example, uh, we've been very aware through you know, recent horrendous fires in Australia, in California, and many other places, of the challenges with forest management and fire suppression. And uh, you know, could we consider distributing sensor networks, interfacing with data analytical and weather models to guide um, the, the response to forest fires and even more guide the, uh, the strategies which uh, avoid them? Uh, Desertification and controlled agriculture, uh, which links again to water use and water distribution. Uh, and again, I've already alluded to our intent to uh, produce highly intelligent built environments. Next slide, please. So 
Um, I'm now going to talk about some of our uh, research response to uh, COVID-19. Um, so research into the origins and cure and spread and broader impacts of COVID-19 spans dozens of activities literally across all five schools. And I will just touch on some examples in the next few minutes and you'll see further the work of uh, some of the people shown here. But again, uh, this is uh, illustrates that we have research from all the five schools. And I've given uh, uh, a favor position as well for Amos, which is our new supercomputer, which is a, uh, a real star in this area. It's part of the what's called the National uh, COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium, which has provided uh, sort of reservoirs of computational time uh, for researchers across the country uh, to produce very high complex fidelity models of, of the COVID virus and its spread. Uh, and this actually garnered uh, 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 publicity from the President of the United States when this was uh, announced. Uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic was announced by name in the announcement of this high performance computing consortium. I'll come back a little more to this. So next slide, please. So for the area of cure and treatment, um, you know, one of our flagship efforts is between Professor John Dordick and Professor Bob Linhart, who have already established international preeminence for their work in heparin. Uh, they were involved in understanding the uh, heparin, uh, the, 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 the health outbreak which arose from heparin a decade ago, and they're now right at the forefront of uh, creating uh, with uh, uh, industrial partners, biomanufacturing partners, artificial heparin. And it turns out that heparin is, uh, you know, a very uh, promising uh, uh, potential um, uh, cure for, uh, not cure, but um, um, treatment for uh, uh, heparin, uh, reducing COVID-19 activity, so a therapeutic, in other words. Um, you know, at one time, the size of uh, harks back to when rendesivir was reckoned to be one of the miracle drugs, and of course, that has changed somewhat. Um, but heparin is one of the potential therapeutic treatments uh, which is being studied broadly uh, for mitigating the effects of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and there's a broad swath of other work in such therapeutic approaches at Rensselaer, including by Professors Kathy Royer and Guy Montelion on repurposing existing drugs. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, C protease inhibitors in the collaboration with Mount Sinai. Uh, Professor Chan Yu Wang is also applying high through drug put screening to discover novel small particles that can uh, disrupt the interaction of the spike protein on the virus uh, with the cellular ACE2 receptor in the body, which is the main entry mechanism, of course, for the virus into the body. Professor Chris Beistroff is exploring protein therapeutics to block the viral entry in the cell. And if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, Professor Steve Kramer uh, in our chemical engineering department is working on a project with Johns Hopkins to buy and manufacture the reagents and antigens for large-scale convalescent plasma, plasma production and purification. Um, so this shows examples of how Rensselaer researchers have been right at the forefront of developing, um, developing uh, therapeutic approaches uh, to treating the virus. Uh, and I should also mention Jennifer Hurley, uh, who is examining the effects of the circadian clock rhythm on the immune response to COVID-19. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in modeling and data analytic activities, our Institute for Data Exploration and Analysis, led by Professor Jim Hendler, uh, and researchers such as Professor Malik Magdun Ismail in our computer science department, have been developing models that predict the evolution of the academic nationally, regionally, and locally, and within our own community here in Rensselaer to inform our testing uh, uh, schedules on campus, which has been an, really, in my opinion, quite an extraordinary response to the uh, COVID-19 virus. So these models, this epidemiological modeling, has uh, basically helped us design the optimum testing schedule for our population, um, 
We've developed our own uh, sampling and testing capabilities on campus and have done this since uh, opening back in uh, uh, August of last year. And at currently, every undergraduate student who has access to campus and every graduate student who has access to campus is tested twice weekly. And uh, all of our staff and faculty are also tested on, on different schedules. And this has been absolutely critical at keeping the virus at bay. Uh, and broadly, certainly last semester, uh, we've uh, uh, had population, had cases well, well below the general and local population. Um, as some of you may know, we're going through something of a, uh, of a uh, growth at the moment, and we've uh, recently pivoted to two weeks of online instruction to bring you know, the cases uh, under control. But again, we're talking a handful of cases each day at our peak at the moment, and last semester being zero or one. I mean, the response to containing the virus on campus has been terrific. It's been driven by epidemiological model or guided by epidemiological uh, modeling, and then taking advance of our biotechnology expertise on campus under the leadership of Professor John Dordick and our heparin lab to be able to create our own testing capabilities. And it's what has kept our population so much safer than the outside world. So, uh, and we have many other uh, modeling activities. Uh, uh, professors like Mohamedou Dayan and uh, Jiangxi Gao have developed models that capture the viral spread due to transportational patterns. Um, a highly successful transmission model inspired by gas vein chemistry has been developed by Professor Yungfin Shi uh, in our materials department. So the point I'm trying to make here is the RPI community have rallied to address COVID-19 on campus, uh, in the region, and nationally and internationally. So if I could have the next slide, please. I'm going to reproduce this highlight because we're so proud of it that our supercomputer Amos has been a, a wonderful uh, player in this as well. So the White House announced this uh, high-performance computing consortium as a new partnership to unleash U.S. supercomputing resources to fight COVID-19. And again, Rensselaer was mentioned by institution in the presidential announcement here. And we're working uh, uh, both here on campus and with major uh, partners across the uh, nation to understand and optimize medical supply chains, to repurpose existing drugs, to understand the basic molecular mechanisms of the virus with Professor Harold Weinstein at Cornell, uh, and to understand the optimum mechanisms for very large scale contact tracing. So next slide, please. We've also um, uh, been active in, in um, uh, both locally and uh, nationally in protecting the community using personal protective equipment. In, in a record time frame of just a few weeks, uh, we worked with Mount Sinai uh, to develop then what was a very a novel UV sterilization capability for N95 masks. And this is uh, evolving into more of a uh, broader technology now. But when Mount Sinai came to us early, uh, of course, one of the major medical hospitals in New York City, uh, came to us early in this crisis to uh, seek our help, um, you know, we were very proactive in being able to design new sterilization systems. And this has actually been now submitted for emergency youth authorization. Um, we were fortunate that just as the crisis hit, it dissipated somewhat uh, rapidly in the New York area. Um, but uh, we had this backlog of inventions, which are there should we ever come back to the same level of infections we were suffering from or illness we were suffering from back in March and April. Um, we also faced a uh, you know nationwide shortage of uh, personal protective equipment in the early days, uh, and one thing particularly which both local hospitals uh, and our own community wanted to do was get access to face shields. And there are a number of different um, you know sort of uh, uh, maker kits developed for uh, um, 3D printers to create face shields, and we started working in that area. We realized that best we could create, even with a fleet of these things, maybe a couple of hundred shields a day. Um, so we then developed engineering principles led by Sam Chapone in our manufacturing innovation laboratory 
and the team he put together to make face shields internally as well. And uh, using plastic injection molding techniques, we amped up the ability to make perhaps hundreds to make well over 10,000 to date. We've distributed thousands in RPI to every on-campus student, faculty member, and staff who needs them. We distributed thousands to local hospital partners. And you know we're ready and waiting to be able to create a thousand or more a week at peak capacity. So again, that's an example of a engineering approach and system approach to the challenges produced by the COVID virus. So if I could have the next slide, please. Final example I'm gonna give is uh, using fundamental science to extend N95 usage lifespan. Um, so again, you know, go back to the days in March and April of last year when uh, people were having to reuse masks in frontline hospital situations under conditions where they absolutely should have not done because of the lack of PPE supplies. So Professor Ed Palermo and Professor Helen Zarr have been working together to develop a new technology to be able to deactivate the virus and not just provide passive protection. And they use basically electrostatic charges within polymer, spin-coated polymer materials on the mask to uh, essentially prevent actively the passage and deactivate the virus as it would otherwise diffuse through the, uh, uh, through the mask material. So I do just want to give a shout out to a couple of other areas um, uh, in other schools. So Professor Ben Chang in our Humanities, Arts and Social Science School developed a Rensselaer Cell Center of Excellence for digital game development. And he has launched something called CureQuest, which is a competition to develop digital games that focus on public health education and awareness and response to COVID-19. Um, Tom Shofi in our Lally School is working on the effects of uh, financial markets and planning. And uh, Professor Jose Holgen Veras in our Department of uh, Civil Engineering, of course, in the School of Engineering, is working on understanding the effects of panic buying on supply chain disruptions. Now, I haven't mentioned everybody in this COVID response. There simply hasn't been time. Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, but we are immensely proud of how our research community has responded to both help our local community, our local population on campus, and the nation at large. So at this point, uh, I'm sure you all hit tired of the sound of my own voice. I'm going to introduce one of our very talented PhD students, uh, uh, Ms. Prachi Pragnia. Um, and uh, I'm very fortunate that uh, Prachi is um, a PhD student. I work with myself in conjunction with Professor Daniel Gull. She got a bachelor's degree in metallurgical and materials engineering um, from the National Institute of Technology in Rukkala in India. And uh, she has been doing some extraordinarily ambitious and to her great um, uh, recognition, successful work uh, on understanding materials in some of the most extreme environments imaginable in uh, concentrated solar power reactors. So I'll pass over to you, Prachi. Good day, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Hall, for the introduction. And uh, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to present my research in this event. Uh, so for that, I'll start sharing my screen. And OK, so for the next 10 minutes, uh, I'll be talking about my research at RPI that is primarily on corrosion of high temp uh, of high performance metal alloy, which is in canal, in a corrosive salt environment maintained at a very high temperature of 700 degrees centigrade and above inside a near atomic resolution microscope, which is uh, the transmission electron microscope. So here is where it matters, the concentrated solar power plants. So. Uh, concentrated solar power technology uh, is an emerging and cost effective uh, technique that is getting widely used uh, to generate electricity from sun's energy. Uh, the top map here shows the current status of all the CSP projects around the world. Most of these plants in operation are localized in uh, Spain, the United States, Morocco, 
and South Africa, while um, North Africa, Middle East and China are constructing most of the new uh, CSP plants. So the recent advancements in efficient harnessing of this uh, clean and renewable energy in the United States is owed to the Sunshot Initiative uh, that was launched uh, by Department of Energy in 2011. Since then, they have strived to improve the performance and reduce the electricity costs, improve the lifetime uh, by improving the reliability of the materials that is used in the solar power plants. So uh, to achieve these targets, some very large fa facilities um, are set up around hotter regions of the country that has a capacity of couple hundred megawatts. These plants employ a variety of different uh, technology, but at the same time, they were successful at powering 100,000 American homes with solar electricity. Uh, if you look at this plot, uh, you'll see that in the past decade, the cost of electricity produced by these concentrated solar power plants has dropped by more than 50% due to the unique ability that allows us to store this and solar heat by uh, heating materials like oil, water, or salt. So this solar uh, heat can uh, then be tapped between sunsets and uh, sunrises or during cloudy weather uh, to provide renewable uh, electricity in demand. Uh, the department is also working to make a CSP even more affordable by improving uh, the lifetime of the uh, of the power plant, which can be done by improving the material of uh, the power plants. And this is where my research findings could help. Okay, but let's first see how these plants work. Uh, the sunlights get reflected by a set of mirrors and is focused onto a central receiver at the top of a tower. The observing material, which is either oil or salt in this tower, transforms the heat, uh, I mean, transforms the sunlight uh, to heat. And it is stored in these fluids in storage tanks made of high performance alloy, like a met, uh, in kernel in this case. Uh, this stored thermal energy can be then tapped uh, to produce electricity using conventional steam turbines. So to I mean to put the perspective, a CSP plant double the size of a football field can power the whole of RPI. Isn't that a very clean, impressive, simple technique to generate electricity? So yes, it appears a very neat and simple until we recognize that in this process, uh, it has created a potential volcano that can spout hot salts with temperatures above 700 degrees centigrade once the hot salt corrodes and ruptures the metal alloy container and i believe that after learning this nobody of us would prefer to be uh, to have it in rpa or be near such a plant so thus um i invested my research at RPI to understand the corrosion of these containment alloys, that is in canal, uh, with molten salt mixture. So first, for the first time ever, I attempted to closely look at the high temperature corrosion of these alloys in real time inside a high resolution microscope, that is a transmission electron microscope that also empowered me to analyze individual grains of the alloy. That means in very small regions of this uh, metal alloy. Uh, 
Uh, but before that, before the actual corrosion experiment inside the high resolution microscope, I had to overcome the most challenging part of my corrosion research. The fabrication of the miniature version of the CSP alloy and molten salt system and to confine that to a two micron area at the tip of the microscope holder that you see the, at, in this picture. So I spent more than a year of my PhD to build this uh, cubic millimeter where I deposited uh, thin films of the container, a container alloy, which is in canal and thin salt films of uh, uh, salt layers, thin films of salt layers uh, on a heater chip, which can be heated to around 1000 degrees centigrade centigrade inside uh, the high resolution microscope uh, in a controlled gas atmosphere. So such unique environmental cell setting inside the ultra high vacuum microscope enabled me to study uh, the corrosion behavior at a very microscopic level with nanoscale spatial resolution and few seconds of temporal resolution in real time. So uh, moving forward, uh, this slide presents some of the results of the high temperature corrosion experiments that I performed inside this high resolution microscope, which is the TEM. These are uh, the top images that you see here are the electron diffraction patterns that I have collected at an earlier time and a later time of corrosion. These uh, diffraction patterns are generated based on the Bragg's law of diffraction that we are that most of us are familiar with in the case of X-ray diffraction, where the periodic structure uh, of the polycrystalline solid produces predictable patterns. So, in sum, these rings with the spots help us identify the phases or materials present in the system. Uh, so each of the spot that we see here correspond to single grains of the material or single uh, periodic crystals of the material. Uh, so each spot around this yellow ring correspond to the grain of the corroding containment alloy in canal. And the disappearance of these spots around the yellow ring at a later corrosion time qualitatively indicates that the grains are getting corroded by the molten salts. This is further analyzed quantitatively by fitting each of these uh, spot or each of these uh, grain with a 2D Gaussian function and plotting the intensity with corrosion time, which is shown here for four such uh, different grains. Uh, the overall decrease, decrease in uh, decreasing trend of this plot indicates uh, the overall decrease in the grain size of uh, individual grains as a result of corrosion with time. So uh, the plot on the right shows a. Uh, it shows the total intensity with corrosion time for some other corrosion experiments at different conditions. Here I have compared uh, the corrosion in presence of water, which is hydrated, and absence of water, which is the top two plots. So here I have realized uh, I have measured a six fold increase in the corrosion rate with hydration indicating that corrosion rate is very sensitive to water. And I have also observed a 1.6 fold increase in the corrosion rate uh, due to with increase in temperature, suggesting the corrosive effects of high temperatures. So, so in total, I have learned a lot about each individual grains of the alloy and how differently they corrode uh, with corrosion time at a very high temperature inside the TEM. And I have, I have quantified the corrosion rates uh, of, uh, of this alloy in different 
temperature and ambient conditions. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude my talk and uh, thank you all for listening. And I would be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. All right, and thank you so much, Prachi, for uh, that wonderful presentation as well as uh, yourself, Dr. Hull. And uh, that concludes the presentation por uh, portion of our program. And we're going to go ahead and turn our attention to the Q&A function to take any questions you might have at this time. Uh, we're gonna, I don't see any questions currently um, in the Q&A portion of WebEx, uh, but we'll give it a few uh, seconds there in case there are. If there aren't, we'll go ahead and conclude the program. So actually, um, I already see one question, which I will answer, Austin. And we had a couple of questions sent ahead of time. Could could you put those into the uh, Q&A? You recall we had a couple of questions which were sent to us ahead of this meeting, if you could put those. There we go, they're starting to come up. All right, so from Velvet Elifumi. Um, so I like the first part of your question. That's brilliant, Velvet. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, so. Uh, your daughter, you say, is in medical school and, uh, you know, part of, I mean, uh, just a basic ethic of research is, is collaborative. It's collaborative across institutions, it's collaborative across countries. Um, so we are always working um, with uh, people in other places. And I would say if you take any of our faculty, I mean, I would estimate that at least 80% of them are collaborating with researchers at other institutions to advance their research, to pool ideas, to combine expertise. So if you wanted to contact me um, just with you know, some extra information, um, and I'm hoping I can type into here my email, uh, maybe useful for other people. Um, and this is where I may see fingers and, oh, here we go. Yeah, here's where I can put my email in. Um, and then, you know, we can see what we might be able, what we could explore. And it seems like this is a useful thing to be able to provide to the audience in general anyway. So I'm hoping that should come up now. And for some reason, I'm not able to hit the send button. Can somebody help me with this on our technical team of experts? Otherwise, maybe it can just be... Hi, Dr. Hall. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you might need to click on the person that asked the question, and then you'll have the ability to to answer to them directly. Oh, thank you. Or to everyone, isn't technology great when it when it works? Thank you. That was brilliant. I like a or will. There's a five second response, and you got it right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, um, and we'll be seeing some additional questions. Something just almost flashed up there about Lake George. So, probably what I need to do is go back into the general Q and A now. Yeah, we do have a question, uh, Dr. Hall from William yeah. Owens. What accounts yeah. for the relatively high cleanliness of Lake George? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I tend to think from the more defensive direction about what can potentially go wrong. We've done a great deal of work, for example, in road salt. Um, so the, the biology of a system as complex as a lake and all the tributaries and all the water sources flowing into it is extremely high. I think Lake George is fortunate for a number of reasons. Um, apart from the southern end and the southeastern end, there is relatively little um, population around the lake. Uh, so most of the lake is not accessible by road apart from maybe 15 to 20 percent in the southern corner and southeast corner. I know that mainly from hiking around there. I'm just trying to picture in my mind. Um, the water sources themselves are, you know, come through relatively pristine areas, not always. Um, there is very great um, conservational focus on what um, uh, habitations there are around the perimeter of Lake George. And then the actual kind of ecological conditions that lead particularly to harmful algae blooms are very complex. And Lake George is relatively sort of uh, fortunate in that respect in terms of, of currents or temperature profiles through the water um, and, 
uh, from you know basically the biological patterns that creates and they seem to suppress the formation of harmful algae blooms uh, which is the main focus right because uh, such algae is a I mean, uh, more trivially, perhaps they're unattractive, but they also lead to human health conditions. Um, they have sort of a, a human response to uh, some some of the uh, products of the algae. So uh, I think it's a combination of fortunate environmental factors and controlled uh, human factors. But it did have the first harmful algae bloom uh, earlier this year. And our RPI and IBM team were on it like a rocket. You know, we deployed within 24 hours. Um, and that's in the days of being, you know, completely careful about COVID distancing and everything um, to understand that. And, and, and that analysis is ongoing. So it's a great question. And it is a beautiful lake. I mean, if you climb in the hills above it and you look across this on a sunny day, this end, what seemed a beautiful endless blue stretch with islands dotted across it, it is a gem to keep hold of. And of course, we want to be able to extend that uh, to other freshwater systems. Um, so there's another question on what is the current status of Rensselaer research participation and space exploration programs? Um, so we do have quite a lot of uh, uh, work funded by NASA. And I'll give just a, some touch. So we recently had um, biological experiments go into space. Uh, that was directed by Professor Liz Bleber in our biomedical engineering department. Um, we have a large center from NASA, which is led by Professor Karen Rogers in our Earth and Environmental Sciences Department, um, which understands essentially, I mean, that, that particular center is focused on understanding the prebiotic conditions on Earth. Basically, what was the chemical mix which led to the evolution of life, which is really pretty exciting. Um, you know, so this is uh, setting up laboratories which reproduce the conditions on Earth, um, you know, billions of years ago. Uh, another professor in the same department, Bruce Watson, um, you know, received, you know, worldwide fame for his work, which established that um, the Earth, you know, five billion years ago, I think it was between four and five billion years ago, if my memory serves me. Um, was not a fiery waste, that it was basically wet and dense. And that was a very important part of the understanding of uh, you know, early planetary science on Earth. And you know, his work wasn't the first that thought of this possibility, but essentially confirmed it. Um, and uh, many of these uh, technologies uh, are potentially transformable to terraforming. Um, so, we have work which goes into space and we have science which is transportable to space and i will say as an example of this we had uh, for the Mar latest mars landing we had like an institute wide party led by professor karen rogers center um and they decided they would live stream uh the event and uh, have some art rensselaer and external experts provide commentary um, we thought we might get a few dozen people involved in that. It turned out we had an audience of many hundreds. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement. And we're looking forward to the Europa landing, I guess, in about 2026 for the next big party. Um, that launches in 24, so maybe more like 25. Um, actually, another thing I'd love to point out in this area is um, Professor Kurt Anderson and our aerospace department, part of mechanical aerospace and nuclear. Um, is doing really important work on understanding how to uh, uh, be able to collect space debris. Um, there's a lot of stuff floating out there now in uh, geostationary orbits, and that's another particularly interesting aspect. Um, so, um, I, and we know that you know national security, communication, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Even you know, thinking ahead to being able to mine asteroids for. Uh, elements and rare abundance. There's a lot of forward looking work that we're thinking of uh, expanding and developing uh, as the agencies start to look further and further forward to other aspects of space. So that's a great question. Um, thank you. Um, does RPI's COVID research involve subdermal implants? Um, so actually, you know, 
as a scientist or an engineer, I'm trained to say when I don't know. Uh, as the acting VP for research, I try and keep my finger on the pulse of the broader Rensselaer research program. Um, but again, if the person who posed that question would like to follow up with the email I provided, I can uh, develop a, uh, uh, you know, a more informed response to that by talking to my colleagues. All right, so um, have I got all, uh, there's more questions coming in, I think. That's great. So um, I don't see the email address yet. Okay, because I think I'd sent it to somebody unintentionally privately. So um, do we, we, so we've got his email address from Tom Bedevin. Thank you, right. Um, and we've got the current status of Rensselaer Research Participation and Space Exploration Programs. So I'm going to encourage somebody to come up with a question for Prachi because uh, she is awesome at answering questions. All right, Prachi, so I'm going to ask you a question. I'm really putting you on the uh, foot here because I know if I ask you any question about your research, you'll, you'll just answer it perfectly. But what is it? The most excites you about being a graduate student at Rensselaer? And I should have asked you this before we're live now, but um, so this is an entirely spontaneous response. Um, what do you enjoy most about being a graduate student at RPI? Uh, the most diverse group that I got to work with. And you mean diverse in which dimensions? Uh, I mean, uh, people from so many countries, so many different uh, scientific backgrounds, so many different collaborations, and we all work together for um, the common um, goal, right? So well, that is, yeah. You couldn't have come up with a better answer if I had uh, given you 10 weeks to think about it. Thank you, Pranji, that's wonderful, uh, that's wonderful. All right, so I'm not seeing further questions at the moment. Um, so um, here's a link to the Mars event. Thank you, Tom. That was wonderful. Um, can somebody help me in case I might have missed any questions? I really enjoy the ones we've had. We, um, we have one more, Dr. Hall, from Anna Martinez. Uh, yes. What would you say helped you most in finding the research you wanted to pursue? And I, I think this might be for or uh, Prachi. Okay. Um, so it's, for me, it's mostly about which is the emerging field. I mean, where is uh, the most research effort required, right? I'm like, and I, if I'm helpful, I'll definitely dive in. So, I mean, uh, I mean, this whole COVID situation happened and anyone who was even partially helpful to improve the situation did want to contribute in a similar way i look at projects uh i look at projects uh and see if i can be helpful and that's how i get uh to work on a project that i like <laughs> that, that that i ultimately like because of the findings um, from the research or, I mean, it keeps on going interesting with time, the more you engage in it, yeah. Thank you, Prachi, and thank you, Anna Martinez, for your question, that's wonderful. So I, I guess we're probably at the point where I believe we've addressed the questions which have come up and you probably want to wrap up, Austin, so I'll pass back over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Hall. And that brings us to the end of our time today. I thank everyone who was able to join us and for those of you that submitted questions to us. We really appreciate it. I also wanted to thank Dr. Hull and Prachi for sharing the research at Rensselaer with our international community. As mentioned, we hope to have an in-person international event once it's safe to do so. But in the meantime, we encourage everyone to participate in our virtual programming that we do have available, including a virtual reunion and homecoming program coming between April 14th and the 16th. Events include a presidential state of the Institute address, a class alive student panel, and a presidential global game changers panel online featuring a topic of women and leadership. Please visit alumni.rpi.edu slash RHC schedule for more details. If you'd like to learn more, please feel free to reach out to me at the information shown on the screen. 
And with that, we thank you all again. Stay healthy, stay safe, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.